All right, we're going to move into our Q&A portion now. So if everybody would just ask their one question with no long monologues, that is what we would prefer. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you. First of all, can I thank you for coming here today. And I've kind of been a fan of yours ever since I saw you on the um, Ruben Report thing. Dave Rubin. Yes. And, yeah, and yeah. You talk, great show. And you talked about this. And I was, because I've heard a lot of stuff about post-truth politics. And how does that apply to academia? And how does it apply to politics? And how do you see that from your eyes? I didn't hear what you said. Um, mm -hmm. Post-truth politics? Oh, post-truth. What do you think oh, of that? Yes, yes. How do you think it applies? Please, please, I think it He's heard a lot. Well, he saw me on the Dave Rubin show, and I want to give Dave Rubin a plug because Dave Rubin is a, is a podcaster, but he has, I think, millions of uh, viewers, and he tries to, he's a liberal gay guy from L.A., uh, but he is, wants to have free speech. He's a proponent of free speech and reasonable discussion. He brings in liberals and conservatives together. And he thinks maybe we can do more with friendship and, and peaceful, uh, respectful discussion. And he and I were together on a panel at University of Oregon. And he had, they brought in like, I don't know, he had some Navy SEALs or somebody who's going to protect us. I said, this is ridiculous. It's, we're talking about free speech and the Antifa said they were going to shut it down. Um, but at the last minute, something bigger was happening. Maybe, maybe Milo was speaking somewhere. So they left. And I was there with Dave. And, uh, and, but a lot of the protesters stayed. And they came up and asked uh, questions. And it was like the greatest event. People that disagreed with each other, but they got on. Anyway, that's Dave Rubin. And he, he promotes that. What your question was, Oh gosh, let me get to it. It was what? Post truth ah. politics. Oh, yeah, post -truth. How do you see that and how do you think it yeah. applies to what you study? Um, yes, the, I, I see this on both the right and the left. This idea of post truth. And it's, it's a rebellion against uh, the Enlightenment, it's a, about rationality, about uh, having to, you know, a, a kind of uh, being open about your your facts, your, your assumptions, showing why you believe something and not just dogmatically asserting it. So what's happened now is both sides seem to claim that the other side, that each side has their own facts. And uh, now there are some, that sometimes it's hard to get to the truth. There are some situations where it's metaphysically impossible to know what happened and who was right and who was wrong. But there are other areas where we, we do a pretty good job. So, for example, if you want to find out like what's happening in education, who's doing better? Well, the Department of Education, uh, the, the, the Center for Education Statistics, absolute uh, standard for solid research, and they have the data. You can look at it. There's, an, there's not, you know, we have to look at it. And, um, it's not an argument. But uh, I, I was recently at George Washington University, and I was, I was saying how this wage gap is wrong, and you know, these are the facts. And, uh, a young woman stood up and said, well, I, you're acting as if the truth is something real and, you know, there are many, many truths. And I just told her not to be, uh, I didn't mean to be facetious, but I just said, oh, there are many, many truths. Well, try telling that to the next time you're audited by the IRS. You know, she said, oh, there are many truths here. <laughs> I don't know what, you know, I have these numbers, you have them. No, there's, there's, <coughs> and then you look at, uh, uh, Mr. President Trump and the number of people who were at his uh, inauguration. Um, there are photographs. There's a, there's a real number there. So I think we're I think you know Dave Rubin is someone who would agree with me on this. I think we're all at risk if we become cynical about truth and act as if there can't be an objective. There's no objective reality. Um, there is, and uh, well, as a philosopher, I. I know there could be some arguments against that, but practically speaking, we we have to we have to come to some kind of agreement and uh, not go down a, a rabbit hole into alternative facts. And both sides are doing it. Yes. Um, so you speak a lot about these kind of feminist myths, as you call them. And I'm wondering if you could address the kind of myths of liberalism, 19th century liberalism. To it, which is very much tied to this idea of the kind of laissez faire capitalist market um, and trickle down economics, that everybody should benefit ultimately. 
um, in a kind of almost equal way, just sort of the natural functioning of the marketplace. Um, so, I mean, what would you say about this kind of liberal myth that we are all starting from the same playing field, right? Which is to say there are no structural inequalities based on gender, race, or class, even though the 19th century governments in Europe had to recognize that they had to pass legislation in order to deal with the kind of abuses that working classes were facing in their factories. Oh, yes. Uh, to me, the interesting question is not uh, why are people still poor? Because people were, throughout most of history, the vast majority of people were very poor, hardly getting by. The interesting question is why did, some, did people get rich? Why, where, and why did so many people get wealthy and suddenly have uh, you know, much longer life expectancy, much, and all the major indices of well-being, uh, more educated and healthier? And, uh, and it appears that one of the major liberating forces is, was uh, the free market and with, with, with an industrialization and those two coming together. Now, in the beginning, it, there were terrible casualties, and you can read Charles Dickens uh, to, to, to see in the, in the 19th century and early 20th century. It's, but when you give people economic freedom and you have this uh, you know, a payoff for su su succeeding, it started this engine of prosperity, and it created something <laughs> called the middle class. Because in most of history, they were the very, very rich, and then everyone else. And that's what the, the free market gives you, is the middle class. And we have to struggle. I don't say that it, it, it's... It, the free market is basically, as I said, economic liberty. And any liberty can be abused. So we do need to have laws to protect people from exploiting. And uh, But I would say for people all over the world, if you don't have a free market, if you don't have economic freedom, you're probably poor and you're, you're probably, uh, you're, you probably have a totalitarian government. It's, so that's why I say it's not uh, a perfect system, but it's, it's the best we've got. I don't see an alternative. So I don't consider it a myth about capitalism. <laughs> I, what I think is a, a, a distortion. That I read the other day that all these young people uh, in the United States, millennials, and it's, again, I don't know, it was in a newspaper, I'm not sure I trust this statistic, but a huge proportion of them are now socialists, and I couldn't help but think, maybe it's because they don't know history. Maybe they haven't read, uh, you know, about Venezuela and Cuba and North Korea, or Eastern Europe before and after, go look at photographs of Eastern Europe before and after uh, democratic socialism. Yes. Um, so you have a lot of things that you have a lot of beef with in the feminist movement, and you talked mostly about things that you found were negative. Can you talk about some positive, like, actual things that you as an activity feminist believe that we need to move towards? Well, that is my favorite topic, because I, uh, I read a few months ago that, that uh, a poll, and they asked Americans, are you feminist? And only 26% said yes, the rest said no. And they asked people, why not? And they, I don't know, they had various reasons. Uh, but then I just thought, how weird. Here we have a movement that liberated women in, throughout the world. Uh, women organized, fought for, and won their, their basic rights. The liberation of women is one of the great chapters in the history of freedom. And yet, the movement, that represents that is <laughs> in, uh, is, has been um, rejected by a lot of people. People don't want to be feminists. And I find that sad. And I actually wrote a piece in The Atlantic, how to get more people to be feminists. And I think that the, the same poll, this is u.gov, they then asked them, well, why aren't you a feminist? And the number one reason is they said it's too rad, too extreme, not rad, too extreme. And I think, and that's sort of what I've been writing <coughs> throughout my career, is that uh, the movement was hijacked by radical women. They have a right to their views. At my party, they would be there. They just wouldn't be the only people there. I want diversity. I want an inclusive feminism. And I don't think we have that now. So that is, so that makes me sad. But what I like, I mean, feminism, what's, I mean, it, it freed women. It brought women into the, 
uh, world where we could, uh, we created a world where women could be um, joined. Especially when in this country the highest rates of those on welfare are southern single white men, specifically. How and when, when decommodification levels are, you know, higher, that means that everybody, the pay gap lowers, everything kind of gets better. So how is the capitalist system, which has been statistically proven to cause a higher separation between different <coughs> groups, not just women, race, gender, um, how does that equate to feminism or being helpful to women at all? Well, first of all, you're not, you're not contrasting capitalism uh, with the non-capitalist system, all right? The Nordic countries are very capitalist and they're free markets. So let's just say that. So then what you're really saying is, shouldn't we have a big, bigger welfare state than we've had? Am I wrong? Is that what you're saying? Um, because women, you think they're doing better there. Is that uh, right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're wrong in what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that I'm advocating for right to free, like, universal health care for all people, universal education that way. If you could get to your one question, we, we're running out of time. Yeah, you yeah is, is she just having universal basic shared rights, like education, health care, that allow both men and women to escalate within society on an equal point? All right. It is more complicated than you're allowing in, in this way. You say, oh, well, they have, they have all these benefits and uh, the lesser wage gap and so forth. The truth is that, uh, number one, we're a much bigger, more diverse country, and they're more homogeneous, but, and so it's easier to, to have a, a, a very generous welfare state. The second is, uh, there are a number of Swedish economists who are trying to figure out why Swedish women are so far behind American women when it comes to advancing in uh, managerial positions and leadership positions. Most Swedish women, I mean, a high proportion work for the government. And they have a lot of welfare policies that allow them to spend a lot of time at home and very, very generous leave. But they now think there may be a cost that we have in the United States, we, it, maybe we should have that, maybe we will vote to have that. We have a more freewheeling system. Uh, we try to, uh, uh, you know, keep taxes down and have let people uh, start businesses with fewer constraints. And, you know, we're, we're moving towards having a lot of constraints, but there's a lot of people that say, no, let's just, let's just have the Wild West and we'll have all these businesses and there'll be all this competition. And, and <coughs> and we do get some, you know, people get the jackpot. A lot of people do very well, and then they hire a lot of people, and you get what we have, which is one of the wealthiest countries the world has ever seen. So you can compare the United States. Should we be more like Sweden? Maybe we should. You can, but every time you put another constraint on business and make it harder to start a business, then you're going to make it harder for women to start businesses. And what we have in the United States is something called a kind of a golden age of female entrepreneurship. They don't have that in Sweden. I've had, I, I've had a graduate students who worked with me from Germany, and they said, they, no one will hire them in Germany. You hire a woman in Germany, and you know, they'll hire you for the government, but in, in private industry, they're afraid because they're just gonna take care of you and pay everything for you, and massive, massive amounts of support. And they, as I said, it's, Reasonable people can differ on whether or not we want to go the way, whether that would work in America. Uh, but I don't see that as any kind of an argument against capitalism. It's an argument for and against various controls on capitalism. Yes? Uh, what's your response to the factual feminist um, counter panel that will occur directly after this? <laughs> My response? Um, I mean, I wouldn't have mind been in invited to be on it and know, listen and respond, but I wasn't welcome. And apparently the reason is someone said, uh, well, no, she had her say, now we have our say. My only problem with that is it's very unusual to hear my point of view because it's probably not represented by professors in this, in, you know, gender studies or uh, women's studies. And so I think that uh, 
you know, that there, there could be a reason to want to engage and that they, they want to have it on their own, so that's fine. I'm glad they're, they came, because apparently you get an award or a t-shirt or something if you go to vote. <laughs> and I, I would kind of like to have the t-shirt, but... <laughs> Thank you, that was our last question, everybody. Oh.